We're going on a guided tour of Gallipoli with Crowded House Tours. Now our knowledge of the Gallipoli campaign is pretty limited, so we thought a guided tour would be the best way to get the most out of the day. We're waiting for a car to come and pick us up and take us to the port. The port is just over there. So the ferry is about 300 metres away. We could have walked. But they offered to come and pick us up, so we thought we'd get the most out of the day and let them do that. I recorded the whole trip. You recorded the whole trip. <laughs> That's it. Bye bye. End of the tour. I take you back to the hotel now. We're coming into Isabat. Welcome. Welcome to Gallopoli. Welcome to Crowded House uh, Tours. My name is uh, Budant. B U L A N T. Budant. Okay. So this afternoon, uh, I will take you all around Anzac uh, battlefields. So tonight, we're going to see Anzac Cove, the first part of the tour, and then uh, the second part, uh, we're going to see the main Australian memorial called Long Pine and then the trenches, the Turkish one and Sekma, uh, still up there, Turkish memorial and finally we end up right on the top uh, for today, the place called Chonak, uh, Chonak Bear. So Chonak Bear, the high point, so Chonak Bear was the main objective like, for ANSAC uh, forces all through the campaign. So to find him, victim, the Allied forces, British, the French, ANSAC, landed which on the Gallipoli Peninsula. So the Gallipoli campaign lasted like about nine months. So after nine months, uh, the decision was uh, by the Allied forces, no points, no sense for Gallipoli, and they decided just quickly withdraw like from the Gallipoli Peninsula. Gallipoli was part of the First World War from 1915. 14 till 1918. The First World War, uh, between the two parts of countries, Germany and the British, the German sites, Germany, Austria, Hungarian Empire, later on, uh, Bulgarian, some plus Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire. On the other sites, the British sites, the British Empire, Russia and France. The First World War, had broken 1914, but at the beginning of the First World War, Ottoman, they were still neutral, still they didn't decide us which sides to be, on the British sides or on the German sides. Just before the First World War, like a couple of months before, Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, they decided order the two battleships to the British to build up uh, or that for defending their countries had been paid a lot of monies. Uh, British quickly built those two battleships sent for the Turks. Really, Turks looking for them, Winston Churchill. So Churchill did a big mistake uh, for the Turks. He decided kept them those two battleships sent for the Turks because they need 
everything right here for the war. British governments said, sorry, what if there's two battleship stickers in the war? And leave them. They keep it, they didn't send to Ottoman Empire. Even they didn't pay back uh, to the Ottoman Empire. So finally, no money, no battleships. Of course, not happy. Germans, very quickly, they used this chance and Germans came up to the Ottoman Empire with really good deals. Was one of them. They sent here two free battleships sent here for you. If you join like an outside. So after the big long the conversation between the Turks and the Germans, Turks they decided join on the German side. So finally the date was the third of November, nineteen fourteen. Ottoman had a sign for the Germans at then officially after the First World War of the German uh, the German side. Of course, after that they were expecting one of the big invasion, one of the big attack uh, by the Allies, by the British, by the French, by the Russians, you know. But the question mark for the Turks, whereabouts it's going to be. A few places they're more expecting. It's one of them, Galopoli, or just be passed at the back, the channel, uh, the water called Dardanelles. But Turks, back then, called for Galopoli or for Dardanelles, like this. Last castle, the last stand before to get to Istanbul. Okay. So the Turks, if they lost Istanbul, means they lost the whole country. Now, the Turks, when they joined the German side officially, like around November, and after that, quickly, they started to prepare all like their defense system on the Galapagos Peninsula to get ready uh, for this attack. They put more fresh troops on the Galapagos Peninsula, they put more guns, repair all like the old Turkish defense all around the Galapagos Peninsula, and Russians ask for help to the Allies at that. Winston Churchill came up with his first plan to Galapagos. His plan was first send the all the British and the French battleships, the Navy, the fleets, whereabouts, top of the Ardennes. The idea was Kill all the Turkish defense. If they succeed, much easier. More of us to all the way up to Istanbul to capture it. If they capture Istanbul, Turks out of the war, sail up the Black Sea, and finally help the Russians. So I was gonna say the idea was the preposition for Galapagos campaign, opening the supply line top to up to Russia. The high points. Now you're looking to the Chonak, uh, Chonak Bay. So Chanak there, the objective uh, for ANSAC forces all through the campaign. So today we end up right up the top. So when we get to the top, you get to see like a why such an important place to care for ANSAC uh, battlefields. Okay. See one of the Turkish islands. It's over there, Turkish islands. Uh, Imros, Gökçe Ada, Gökçe Ada or Imros. Imros back then the British general Sir Ian Hamilton. The commander of the Allied forces, most of the time, his base was there during the campaign at Turkish Island, Imros. It's about 11 miles that came from here, 15 miles that came from here, Lemnos. Lemnos, the big base uh, for the Allied forces, with the supply, food, ammunition, everything from Lemnos to all the way up the Galapagos Peninsula. Okay? So now we're heading to Anzac Cove. Not too far from here, only in a couple of minutes. Get there. But, that's like the 1950, not like this, much wider. It's about 10 or 15 minutes like, but today, not much. Uh, the reason? When we get the next stop, 
you're going to see a couple of things. It's one of them, Anzac Cemetery, called Arenburdo uh, Cemetery, Anzac Cemetery, one of the highlights section of the tour. Uh, I'm sure that probably you've heard about uh, the famous speech by Mustafa Kemal that took uh, to the mothers. Uh, if I say like some, some words like about his speech, like no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets like uh, to us. Johnny, the nickname uh, for the Allied forces. Mehmet, the nickname uh, for the Turkish soldier. Mehmet, a uh, very common first Turkish name uh, for Turkish people, like John, Bill, you know, very common names, the same things, okay? The last part of this speech, as I say, became a ha, sans like as well, you know? Very nice, when you read it, the whole part, you're going to see. So the That'll put a lump in you, sorry. We are here now, the place called Are Porno or Are Porno uh, Cemetery, Amsak Cemetery, or just the word, if you remember, Amsak Club, just around the corner. This is the place, the first touch by the first Anzacs on the 25th of April by the 3rd Australian Brigade, the men from uh, Western Australia, uh, Tasmanians, uh, South Australians and Queenslanders, you know. So we called for them covering forces. So th they were the first ones they came ashore. And then, like around 6 o'clock in the morning, 2nd Australian Brigade also then landed on the Gallipoli. Aribunu Cemetery, full of Enzac graves, beautifully maintained. A lot of men in their twenties and thirties lie here. We're at the site where the Anzac ceremonies are held every year, the 25th of April. What a beautiful place. During the Gallipoli, Anzac, uh, the counter-attack to the Turkish position at one place and after the counter-attack between the two lines, like in the Lowlands, that all that bodies 
wounded officer and the soldier, one of the ANSAC officer, that the wounded yelling from the northern steps, like, help me, help me, but you can't help. If he moves from your position to help him, easily get shot, quickly jump over this position to the northern steps with his white flag, lift him, took him from the northern steps, whereabouts, to back down that position. He left it, quickly came back his own position, and then started again with the shooting, firing, and then to each other. So we call for this one, respect uh, to the Turkish soldier, respect to the Bahmet's uh, statue. The story was uh, a little bit unknown, but nice story, we said all the time, you know, and also no fighting around this place. Uh, most of the time, during the Yolopoli, uh, Turks were controlling this place. The Turks get lots of based looking around here because long time is about half a kilometer right up there. Now we're going to a big Turkish base, like Turkish supply, Turkish reinforcements, Turkish commanding, all set up all around under this place. A memorial uh, called uh, Long Pine, but before that, Ansak Kof, done this way, just imagine it's Ansak Kof, you know, uh, Sula Bay, same direction, Ansak Kof, uh, not too far from here, one kilometer from here, Sula Bay, it's about six, seven kilometers from here, as I said, after the Long Pine, all the way, Ansak Battlefields, if you remember the high points, uh, Chonik there, right up there, it's about three kilometers from here. If you go over that direction, the final goal, remember, the channel, the Dardanelles, so the narrow part of that site, and all the way down to the Cape Hells, where the British French landed. Okay, these are the places, but the most important one for this one, the positions at North Pine, whereabouts they were, Australian position, and of the where the trees are, where the bushes are, so they got that position on the 25th of April. The first step, but and after that, they stay there till when not end of the campaign till August, like from April to up uh, to up the August, exactly in the same positions. Okay, but Turkish position at long time, whereabouts they were, Turkish position roughly where the main spot, where the Vimoris sites, my young king, too. So now we are having the two lines, the and again, this position at long time from April from the beginning till August, okay, about three or Months, exactly with the same positions at all time. But what was happening again? Remember, after the landings till August, all the fierce fighting, the blood is fighting for Gallipoli, for the places, you know, at Ansak or right down the bottom. But the problem was the Allied forces, not a shift in high grounds and objectives, stalemate, deadlock for Gallipoli. And then the British generals uh, quickly organized like, a new plan for Gallipoli. Last big plan uh, for Gallipoli, 6th of August, uh, 20,000 fresh British troops landed the Sula Bay for breakfast style night. The plan was British, when they landed the Sula Bay, on the same time, ANSAC forces, like Sula, ANSAC, all together on the 6th of August. When they landed all together, big wave, they charged from everywhere between ANSAC and Sula to the Turkish positions to capture it for breakfast style night. If they succeed, easily capture the high points. If they capture the Chonic Bay, if they succeed, as you know, what was happening there after that, you know? That was a plan. But what happened actually here during the August Offensive, uh, the Battle of Long Pine, or they called uh, for this one, big diversionary attack at Long Pine. But why diversionary attack at Long Pine uh, by the Australians? One of the reasons, supporting the British landing second at Sula Bay, and then the reason, the main reason, there was a big Turkish base right down there. Like kind of Turkish Atsak curve. Turkish, like a north hitch. Means big base that you have for the Turks right down there. For this one, for Atsak battlefields. Turkish supply, Turkish uh, commanding, Turkish reserve, Turkish reinforcement. Most of the time, right down there, that base to us. If there's something happened, up here or even right up the bottom, if they need help, support, reinforcement. Quickly call the Antan, the 
the Turkish reserve very quickly moved like, into the places, you know. So Australians, of course, they knew about big Turkish bases that go right down there, they knew about the Long Pine position, you know. The idea was at Long Pine uh, for the Australians, charge at Long Pine, big charge, you know, kept them all on the Turkish base, busy, like engaged on the same position, spot them to move to reinforcements, other positions, but especially whereabouts, right up the top of the high points, Chonak there. Why? This is the diversionary, but the real attack at Atsak uh, by the uh, by the news hunters all happening right up the top of the Chonak there. So helping them open the way like they're for them, you know? So when they kept them all busy, the big punch at Atsak on the same time all happening right up the top uh, Chonak uh, by the uh, by the news hunters again. So helping them open the way like they're for them, you know? That was the plan. But what happens? Very quickly. The beginning of the Battle of Long Pine, 6th of August, like around 5.30 like p.m., the first Australian brigades, the men from uh, New South Wales, like the first, second battalions, they were the first ones, how many of them, like about over 2,000 of them, they were on the position, so they ordered them to fix bayonets, ammunition off, and then they charged, like a bayonet charge from their position to the Turkish position over there. They did quickly, all Australians, exactly, they were top of the Turkish position at Long Pine. And then what was happening after that? Quickly they jump into the Turkish position or into the Turkish trenches. The first touch of the Turks and after that the bloodiest fighting action for Gilam. Why? After that over there, the fighting at Long Pine like this. Hand the hand fighting like in the trenches, you know. We called the bayonet like they're fighting. Most of the time they used to look at the bayonets, rifle, pistol, hand grenades, rocks. Whatever, what they found, not on the 6th of August, uh, this battle here, 7th of August, 8th of August, and finally was over when 9th of August, like after three days. But what was happening again between 6th and 9th of August during the Battle of Long Pine? Just imagine, like this all happening, 6th of August again, Australians, when they charge, like the next couple of days, Australians and the Red succeeds. I mean, they move, they captured most of the Turkish position over there, they move a bit down further, you know. And then, end of the day, they were controlling most of the Turkish position down there. But what was happening? The next morning, 7th of August, early in the morning, Turks, the organists, remember? Reinforcement at the back, and then enough reinforcement. The big counterattack down there, top here again. And then, in a couple of days, again, Turks, they were captured back in their positions. And that pushed them back almost times again. Same position, roughly. And then, during the same day, 7th of August, Australians, the organizer again, the big counter-attack, you know, and then they were captured again, got pushed down below the Turks right down there. Turks organized the big counter-attack like this, what he called till 9th of August. The fight over there like this. Tennis match, like back and forth, back and forth, you know, like this. But finally, 9th of August, uh, what was happening early in the morning, Australians again, they end up just behind the tree over there. So after two days, they end up right up there, say three days from there yeah. to over there. But the point, not this one, they succeed, they moved a little bit down further, you know, but the point, remember, was big diversionary, but after three days, end up the big, the great succeeds, the great victory, like for the Australians. When they were fighting here, Chonak there, not heavily defended by the Turks. All Turkish reinforcements stuck right down here, critical time, but finally, 8th of August, and New Zealanders, they captured the Chonic Bay. But, again, this battle, 9th of August, was over. So, after three days, big, like a victory, like a for them, you know, succeed. Even Australians got seven victory crosses, like a for, like an action at Long Pine. But the cost, it's about 4,000 Turks, it's about 2,300 Australians, all totaled together, more than 6,000 of them, killed, wounded, injured, like during the Battle of Long Pine, like in three days. But, the size of the Battle of Long Pine again, not to the area, exactly where you're looking to, the open area. Or maybe the same size, a bit on the left or right hand side. Like kind of, we said all the time, like maybe one or two, like a football, like a field, like on the size, you know, took place like at the Battle of Long Pine. So the reason today, why the main Australian memorial brought up here, not down and Sanko or other places, because most Australian casualties from the Gallipoli, now we are standing up here at Long Pine. Even Nine months they charge from every every position, but only one place with a great success again in this place, you know, at Long Pine. Also, the Turks they called uh, for this place, not Long Pine. We called like this, Kanlı Sırt or 
blood rich or blood rich. What do you call blood rich? Remember, more than 6,000 of them killed, wounded, injured, and entered the battle of Long Pine against the rest. Left hand side is more coming up. Unsack trenches. As you can see, all the remains of the trenches, all unsack, still there. 107 years, all original, or from 1915. But 1915, much deeper, much deeper. It's about two, two and a half meters, like a deep. See, like an uh, tunnel as well, uh, the communication uh, tunnel, but today, Captain just collapse. okay? All original uh, Anzac trenches, now you're looking to. But, not the front line trench, second line. We call, call the second line to each other. Throwing tins of foods, like chocolate, biscuits, cigarettes or tobacco, paper, some part that they're playing the games that get to each other all through the positions like Ansax, for example, from that position, shoving the targets that get to the Turkish position, the Turks that they try to shoot, you know, or Turks that would do the same things, especially one of the Australian officer, Colonel Johnston, you know, he was defending like this position. So Colonel Johnston and his troops making the jobs all the time to the Turkish position means making happy you know, during the quiet time, it's a really good time, they were enjoying it with the Turks, and the reason called named after him, Johnson's uh, Jolly. You know, Jolly means uh, happy, okay, why well, they call Johnson's Jolly. Where about that? Cut this one, and you see where the white panel under the tree, or the first, the broad uh, sign, Turkish line. Are you looking to over there? Okay. Turkish line. If you follow me again, please. This one, <laughs> it says, uh, Ansak, uh, the first ant trench, whereabouts they were. Exactly now we are standing with the top of it. All Ansak line. As you can see, it goes all the way down. So this whole Ansak position. The Ansaks, they were here, and the Turks again with a white information panel over there. So roughly 15, 20 meters high, you know? The road. out of no man's land, heading towards the Turkish trenches. I'm at the Turkish trench. I'm in the Turkish trench. So now we're going to see 
one of the Turkish memorial because today, as I said, 31 cemeteries uh, for Anzacs and for British all around the Gallipoli Peninsula. The Turks got more than 60 of them all around the Gallipoli Peninsula. Our main memorial where the names are for missing ones, right down to the bottom, right down to the Cape Palace. Okay, this one uh, called 57th Regiment's Memorial. 57th Regiment uh, during the Gallipoli campaign, the part of 19th Division. So they're part of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's regiment. But almost half from this regiment all wiped out during the Gallipoli campaign, almost half. Uh, the reason, fighting for their homelands, uh, for their country. And the reason, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, his regiment, is one of the famous order to them on the first day, like this, I don't order you to attack, I order you to die. When we die, other troops and commanders can come and take our place. Means just go and die uh, for the country, you know, the reason. Even other rest of them from the 57th Regiment after the Gallipoli, they moved to other front lines because the Turks after the Gallipoli, they moved all the way down to the Mesopotamia, to the Middle East, where they're fighting again, like in like three years, where they're fighting. But end of the First World War, you know, 1918, uh, this regiment nearly wiped out. Only a few of them survived. Like about 98% of them during the First World War, all gone, you know. So today, Turkish army still big. We got 56, 58, but no 57th uh, regiments like in the Turkish army for respect okay, to them, okay. Uh, today in Turkey, like if you ask any Turkish people all about like this regiment, all about the 57th regiment, uh, I'm sure that you talk something all about this regiment, like a legend uh, for Turkish history, okay? This one, it was built in 19, 1903, 1993, but we called uh, for this one memorial sites, not actual uh, the body is buried, the memorial sites, actually uh, the body is buried right down the gully, right down the big mass grave, like here for them. So you're going to see the memorial sites, okay? When you get to the Turkish memorial, is the point of the entrance on the left hand side, you're going to see the statue of the old man with the little girl. The old man died like about nearly 28 years ago, uh, 1994, when he was 110 years old. Not the last man, he was one of the oldest, like at the war, survivor, like from the Turkish side. We got two more places for today. It's one of them now we're going to the place called the neck or the neck cemetery and we are standing the place called the neck or the neck cemetery again Anzac cemetery but 1915 positions at the neck from the beginning till end of the campaign like about nine months again uh, Australian position just behind the bushes just there Turkish position roughly where the trees are just there so this is the place called the neck down there it drops there and drops down as well like from here so the size of the neck uh, today like two or three tennis courts like a size you know not too big area what happened actually here the battle of the neck was part of august offensive now you're looking to sulla bay the salt lake the first one the next one over there the sulla bay salt lake and sulla bay but this one the charge at the neck not 6th of august 6th of august if you remember Battle of Lone Pine, Battle of Chonakla, the landings of the British Sula Bay, 6th of August, but this one, 7th of August, by the 3rd Light Horse uh, Brigade, the men from Victoria and Western Australia. So the plan actually here, before they go, before they charge uh, at the neck, 7th of August, uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, the first ANSAC, uh, the artillery, bombing, shelling uh, to the Turkish position at the neck for helping them for open the way like for this charge till 4 30 like half an hour after a barrage uh, at the neck so 4 30 they stop the fire and then light horse regiments the 8th and 10th light horse charge from their position to the turkish position over there but not all together four waves each one's like 150 of them at once the first two by the 8th light horse last two by the tank light was but the first big mistake Anzac artillery that stopped 423 about seven minutes too much time actually for the Turks over there to organize 
to turn back back into their position, the commander of the 8th Night Horse Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Alexander White, ordered, don't move, don't charge from their position. Just wait like, until 4.30. So 4.30, the first wave, 8th Night Horse, 150 men, fixed bayonets, ammunition up. They charge, but with this charge was over only like 5-10 seconds. Just imagine, from Turkish position, machine guns or rapid fire, like Mexico, like all oh. white chat, most of them, you know. But five minutes later, the order to try again the second wave. So again, 150 men, 8th Light Force, really in the position, fixed by it. They charge, but same things happen. About 10 minutes later, after the second wave, the third wave, 10th Light Force, same number, they really fixed by it, charge from their position. They try again, but didn't succeed as well, you know. Most like about 20 minutes later, last man, read in the position, their position, fixed by it, they charge, but same things happen. And then the battle of the neck was over. Only 40 minutes. 4 4.30, the beginning in the morning, 10 past 5, like in the morning was over. 40 minutes. How many of them? 600, uh, 600 men were they charged, but how many of them? 372 men were killed, and the rest of them all injured or wounded. In China, not heavily defended by the Turks, critical time, 8th of August, early in the morning, the Wellington Infantry Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel uh, William Malone, the commanding them. So, William Malone, finally, he was exactly right up the top of the China Bay. So, finally, again, the New Zealanders, they were right up the top of the high points and captured. Eighth of August again, early in the morning. If you remember, the first ones they were the Wellington Infantry Battalion. They came up from this way and they end up right up here. And that the controlling group for so today's two nights. And Turks they move back where all the buses are. So today's two nights, the positions at long time like this because from the both sides uh, behind them, not enough uh, support reinforcement to charge again to move again. You know, so today's two nights like this, but Turks more quicker. Turks, like in a couple of days, they get all totaled together like five regiments, like about around 20,000 of them. They arrived from Sula, from Hanles, or from other places, you know. So Turks were quickly organized again. Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, he organized everything, the big counter-attack. But not only one point, now you're looking to, where about they charge like this? Just imagine. From left hand side, from middle, from at the back or from the top, like a big wave, big bayonet charge. All of them on the same time in the action. All of them, more than 20,000 of them, that charge from their positions up here. No chance. Only a couple of thousands of them up here. So no chance. Like a couple of thousand again, you can push them back right down to the reach line and then by the Turkish hands. So this is the place. If I get on my tour uh, from Australia, all the time they ask, keep asking me, like, are we getting on the tour? Uh, and like a long time in the places. But if I get the people from New Zealand, all the time. They keep asking, are we going to see Chonak Bear on the tour? Because this is the place, you know, for them, where they were controlling like for today's two nights. Even in my months, 2,700 not much done this campaign, but how many of them? Just for this place. The beginning 6th of August till 10th of August, 1,300 not them. But almost half, they lost like that man in this battle, you know? So the reason, such an important place, and I'm um, going to see in a couple of seconds, you know, the main memorial uh, for the new organization right off the top, okay? Anzac like Cove, uh, again, it's about three kilometers to all the way down, okay? Sula Bay, some part of the can easily, again, so no trees don't cover the back then, easily cast the whole things at the back, okay? Uh, the first one, again, the main memorial uh, for the New Zealanders section right up the top because they got the Hornets uh, for today's two nights when they're controlling. The reason they built uh, the monuments uh, right up the top. Uh, the names are, like, uh, for them, the big girl, right down this way, right down the road. You're going to solve, like, the names are uh, for, the, uh, for the New Zealanders, okay?
The most important one, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, yeah, right at the top. Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, 10th of August, when he charged big Turkish counter-attack, he was in action near the front line, when he was fighting here, one of the amazing stories from our side, uh, a piece of shirt helped hit his heart, but saved his pocket watch. So pocket watch saved his life. So pocket watch, this is all the time, he changed the history. He did not the 10th of August, you know, heroes that get like called Turkey or the country. Had to tell one of the body the black one of the times. Tap the holes, okay? Well, Turkish one, one part. Now you're looking to the start of the watch from Mustafa Kemal, tell the story from his narrative, you know? But if you go around the left hand side, you get this old English one as well. Imagine story that you can read it, you know? Chunic bear. Well, the New Zealanders lost their lives here. It's pretty amazing how they make all these memorials and graveyards in the exact area where there was all this fighting. And they're beautifully maintained. It's fantastic. Good on the Turkish people. And uh, the decision was just quickly withdraw okay, from the Galapagos Peninsula. They were expecting half casualties, means big number, like okay, for last parts, you know, of the evacuation. Like 120 means more than 60,000 of them, you know, expecting the casualties. But how many of them they were? 120,000 of them. But how many of them they evacuated from the Galapagos Peninsula? Same number means. They were expecting half casualties, but when they evacuated from the Gallipoli, there was no casualties. Not a single soldier was killed all the way through the evacuation. So we can say the last part of the Gallipoli campaign was the most important, successful action for and throughout the campaign for the Allies. Why? <coughs> no casualties. Not a single soldier was killed all the way through the evacuation. Today, we visited all the most important places uh, for Anzac battlefields. I hope. You enjoy the tour, you like the tour. Thank you much for today. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, roughly, we got 10 minutes to make the hour of this. You off to Istanbul or the ferry uh, to Chanak, or other places. Alright, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this
Yeah, we're leaving Isabat. We had a really nice day with Crowded House Tours. We paid 500 lira each. And we got picked up from the hotel. We had a ferry ride from Chinakali to Isabat. Had a nice lunch. Had a bus tour around most of the prominent Anzac sites. A really good guide. He taught us a lot of stuff about the history of the Gallipoli Peninsula and the war. And now we're getting a ferry ride home. What a bargain. <laughs>